and I'll turn it over to our presenter, Melissa. Yes. I am so glad that everyone has joined us today. I don't know what time zone you're in. I'm in Pacific time zone right now. So it is just at the end of my work day. Um, if you are, if you would love, to, I would love to hear where you're from. If you just want to pop that in the chat. Um, I don't get to see any of you today, but you can definitely tell me where you're from. Oh, I'm seeing San Diego, Buffalo. Oh my goodness, Iowa, Maryland, Ohio, Ohio, several people from Ohio from all over the place, many, many different time zones too. Some of you probably have already eaten dinner. I am waiting until after this to eat mine and it's gonna be pasta. Thousand Islands, love it. Oh, and Portland, you're in my same time zone. All right, as I said, the um, handouts are at the short link and the QR code and it will come up at the end of the slide deck as well. So just know that you should be able to get that if you want it. A little bit about me, my name is Melissa. I am an SLP, I've been working in schools for a hot minute. Um, I am in a school district, uh, I call it a mid-sized school district um, in the Pacific Northwest. Um, my professional interests include a lot of AAC, I am an AAC specialist in my district, um, also animal assisted therapy and clinical supervision. Um, personal interests include raising service dogs and bicycling, did it today, even in the rain, um, and lots of canoeing. And I live in Seattle area and I have a lot of golden retrievers. That's, they're rotating, which is a pretty fun thing for me. I always have at least one, sometimes two. Um, as I said, I work for a school district in Edmonds, Washington. Um, we are about 20,000 students, give or take. Um, I work for them and I am being paid for presenting today. And there's a little bit of information about my school district just to kind of get some background on where I'm coming from. Um, and the Edmonds School District is the school district that I'll kind of be describing today when I'm talking about the tiers and how we have implemented AAC in a new and exciting way in our district. Enough about me though. Let's talk a little bit about you. Are you? struggling to support AAC learners with multiple different apps in the same classroom? Perhaps trying to explain to your admin again why you need another app. <laughs> My admin got tired of me doing that. Um, supporting burned out teachers and SLPs who just can't learn another AAC system. Feeling like you're failing your learners because you know that they need more and you know that their complex needs are important and you just don't have time. I, I ask is that you because I have been every single one of those people. Um, and I am, and we need to talk about that because that is a very common experience in AAC. AAC is a big, big field. It's got so many different things. The pace that technology is changing and developing these days, it's just feels like a fire hose often. You're just like, there's so much to do and how on earth do we make that manageable and approachable for the specialists? <laughs> Let's just say that. Let's say for the SLPs and the assistive tech people and like the people who specialize in AAC, for us, it's super hard to keep up on everything. And then you go, you know, ring out from that, like our special ed teachers, our para educators, like how on earth do we keep everybody up to date? It is a challenge. It's a big challenge, um, but I have something to talk about and share with you that I think might help, and that's what we're going to get into. That's that's what this next hour will be about. This slide is in here, 165,000. That's a very big number. Um, that number came from the Comprehensive Literacy for All book, which came out, I believe, in 2020 um, by Dr. Karen Erickson and uh, Dr. David Copenhaver. They are over in the, um, the east side of the state. Um, they wrote this amazing book called Comprehensive Literacy for All. If you haven't read it, I really recommend it. It is talking about how to teach literacy skills to non-speaking students who have significant disabilities. Um, all sorts of disabilities, all sorts of abilities, um, and it's a really great book. And a lot of what I do now comes straight out of that book. Um, 
but this number is the number of students with significant disabilities in U.S. public schools who can't meet their face-to-face -face needs using speech signs or aid days. They, that's how many kids are out there, approximately, who don't have any way to communicate at all. It's a big number and it's an important number and it's a, it's a bad number. That's too many is what it is. That's, that's a lot of students. Uh, and many of them are in my district and many more of them used to be in my district. Um, this is a number that motivates me to do something about it because every, it needs to be zero is what it needs to be. Every student needs to be able to communicate um, and to be learning how to communicate better. So that number, I, I wanted to lead with that number because that's the background for the why. Why do we, why is this important? Why do we need to get better at this? Why, 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 why? It's this number because every one of those is a student who needs and deserves better. Now, this number is another number that I wanted to lead with because I am very proud of this number. This number is the percent increase in high-tech AAC use in my district from 2018 to 2023. That's also a big number. I did not do that by myself, by the way. I am very proud of that because I was part of that work. Um, I was one of the leaders who was leading that work, but I did not do that. My whole district did that. The SLPs in our district, the special ed teachers in our district, the pairs in our district have played a massive number, massive role in that number. Um, that percentage of increase in the kid, students who we have who are using robust high-tech AAC in Edmonds. Um, but how? How did we do that? Stay tuned and I will tell you. This whole hour is talking about the concept of tiers. Um, taken from like the, the idea of multi-tiered systems of support, which if you're in public schools, you have heard about MTSS, um, probably not applied to AAC though. It applies to a lot of other like, behavior supports, learning supports. It's, it's a concept that's gained a lot of steam in recent years. Um, the idea being <clears throat> that a tier one is something that is available to everybody. It's a tool or support that is just universal. Everybody has access to it. Tier two is there's going to be a smaller number of students, but still fairly substantial who need more than that tier one. And so there's an identified set of tools for whatever purpose for that smaller number of students. And then the tier three is a very small number of students who those other tools don't fit their needs and they're gonna need something that's really customized just for them. So that is MTSS. And then the specific language system first approach was uh, that term was coined by Chris Bouguet, um, who is an AT specialist. Um, he does has a podcast. He also presents quite a bit. I'm sure you've heard his name. If you haven't, you should look him up because um, he's the mover and shaker in this area. Um, but his idea was um, for a specific language system first was instead of having every tool on the table, pick one that's kind of your go-to and train and make that one really efficient so that everybody has access to it and see what happens when you do that. So this is a combo of those two uh, big ideas. Um, it is important to know that when we're talking about these tiers, they are not a sequence. It is not that you start with tier one and if you flunk at that, then you get to go into tier two. And if you still fail at that, then you, then you finally get access to the things you need. No, it is intended as a way to organize the tools, not a way to organize the students. Any student could access any level of tools based on what they need. And if you know what they need, they go straight into that, it, they get, go straight to that tool. They don't need to, it's not a sequence basically. That is very important. And a lot of times when people think that they disagree with this concept, it's because they think it's a sequence and it is not. Um, it is also very important just to remind, remind everybody, I'm sure you already know this, there are no prerequisites for using robust and or high-tech AAC. And we are not saying that there are when we are implementing this kind of a tier system. So that's kind of the background. I'm gonna take a breath and acknowledge that those two concepts are real big and a seismic shift in 
in AAC land from an SLP perspective. Uh, I have been in the field for about a decade and a half, and I was not taught any of this. I was taught in grad school that a full AAC eval with feature matching and all of this was necessary before I could start any AAC. Um, this is a big paradigm shift. Like it was for me and for all of us, it probably is. Um, it's a big shift from that kind of prove it, prove that you need it um, paradigm to to one where we know that there's no prerequisite skills, that giving access to full AAC systems is the way that we develop the language, not that you have to develop the language or prerequisite skills first before you get the system, but that the system is actually how you develop the skills. Um, and that one of the biggest factors in terms of whether an AAC system or trial or whatever is going to succeed, one of the biggest factors for success for AAC for children in a school system is how comfortable all the grown-ups around them are with that system. If the adults around that student don't know what to do with it and just leave it sitting on a table, it's probably going to fail. You're going to get massively high device abandonment um, because the kid's not going to know what to do. And if the but if all of those adults around that student are comfortable with it and know what to do with it and know how to demonstrate it for the student, that that is one of the it's not the only factor, but it's one of the biggest big big factors in whether or not AAC implementation will be successful. Um, this is a big shift, and as I, as we have been working through that shift in Edmonds, these kind of three concepts are the ones that keep coming up as things that we need to talk about and explain with our staff a lot. Um, it's been a lot of training and talking and consensus building around these concepts to make it so that everybody feels comfortable with it. So here is the chart. I love charts. They make my heart happy. Kind of comparing and organizing those ideas. In the specific language system first kind of concepts, we have the, the fact that most AAC apps offer similar features. It used to be that different AAC systems were wildly different and there was a lot of different features that you couldn't find between devices. Um, but now that they're all apps, once one developer has a good idea, give it six months and the rest of them will probably be rolling out something pretty similar, which is fantastic. It is amazing how fast technology can evolve and change and grow. But it also means that a lot of our robust apps are pretty similar. They have some differences, but they're pretty similar. And it's moved from being this extremely niche thing to being something that you can buy on an app store for 50 bucks or more. Um, that classroom imp implementation piece is a huge piece of whether AAC implementation is going to work for your students, whether they're, whether they're going to catch on and get it. Um, and with those two things in mind, streamlining those AAC options enables better implementation because the staff can know what to do and it can really prevent that device abandonment and failure. And those multi-tiered systems of support are a system-wide approach to making sure that the resources and tools are available, that they're differentiated, that you have that tier one universal access to quality tools for everybody, targeted interventions for a smaller group of students, and then intensive interventions for that very small number of students who really have very specific unique needs. Another chart. I told you they make my heart happy. So there will be there will be quite a few of them. This chart that we're looking at is the overview of the Edmonds School District tiers. The green tier, tier one, um, which we will provide to anybody, is a light tech core board. Anybody can get it. We print them in bulk um, from our print shop and just send them out through district mail to anybody who wants. No, no reason needs to be given. Just if you ask us for a core board, we'll give you a core board. Um, we provide training to our SLPs and to our classroom staff on what is AAC modeling and how do you do it um, and give have some handouts for families as well. Our tier two in our district is an iPad with the touch chat with WordPower app. Um, side note, I'm not trying to convince anybody that WordPower is the best. There are lots of robust apps. If it's robust, it could be a good option for you. Um, 
our district went with touch chat because that was what fit our context and needs the best. There isn't one best app, but you will see touch chat in this presentation because that's all of my examples because this is a case study of my district. Um, we recommend that people start with WordPower 60 Basic. They might go up from there, but we don't really let people go down. I'll talk more about that later. The way that a student would get access to that is if their SLP says, hey, this kid needs voice output, they need tier two, and then we send it out based on the building SLP's recommendation. Uh, we're providing training for our SLPs on the app itself, because that's the tier two. Um, and for the classroom staff, it's more like orientation, kind of how do you, how do you navigate it? Um, and then our tier three is that unique students who have a very specific need. We use the set process, which is developed by Joy Zavala, um, for looking at assistive tech tools and what might fit that student best. Um, and it's very much a feature matching situation. Um, any tool is on the table, whatever works for them and their specific needs is what we end up doing. Um, and that is more like working specifically with our AAC specialists and assistive tech team and the SLPs and the IEP team in the building to figure out exactly what that student needs. And then we provide on training for that. So that is the overview. This was a process. So you are hearing about it in 60 minutes. Um, it took us multiple years to build all of these pieces and get it all into a functioning system. It is now fully implemented and I am loving it, um, but it did not happen overnight. And I just, I don't want anybody to think that it will happen overnight. It took a lot of time talking and building consensus with our staff to say, which tool should we use? Let's let's get comfortable with this concept of tiers. Which app should it be? What other tools do we have? Why are we even doing this? Um, and it did kind of feel like this graphic. Um, another side note, I love, I love side notes. Um, I've been playing with um, Im generative, like image-based AI. Um, and this, I think I put in teachers collaborating. <laughs> and this was the image that came up. And I was like, yeah, that's, that's kind of what it feels like sometimes. Hmm. Um, it took a while, but it was totally worth it to put in all of that time. I would say for us, it took about five to six years to like fully, fully get everything all the way implemented. Our tier one, let's, let's dig into that a little more. In our district, it is a core board. Initially in our district, we made our own core board and it was a very cool one. It had like an L shape for the core words and then it had some flip pages on the top right actually really liked our core board. Um, we came up with the tier one first and then we figured out our tier two. And then we came back and was like, you know what? Touch that actually has some pretty great light tech boards. Let's let's switch out and switch over and use touch chat boards. So we are now using our the touch chat light tech boards as our universal core. Um, touch chat has it available in multiple languages. And as I said, any staff member can request it. Any student or parent can request it. Um, pretty straightforward. We provide those boards. We print them in bulk so that we just have them ready to go to send out whenever somebody asks. The, the, the idea is that we want to make it easy. We want to make it really easy to use a good tool, which means it needs to be printed. We print it on tear-free paper, which makes means that teachers don't need to laminate it um, and they last a lot longer. And if we have them printed ahead of time, once they ask us for them, we can just send them out and they have it by the end of the week. So when a teacher is like, oh my gosh, I have a new student, they're not speaking, I need some visuals. We can be like, oh, let's just put this in the mail for you today. You'll get it, you know, get it on Tuesday. Let's keep problem solving and figure out what else. But it, it really, really helps to have something that's ready to go immediately um, for when staff need support um, and reach out for that. And we focus all of our staff training at, the, at tier one on what is AAC modeling? How do you do it? No, really, it's without expectation. Please don't use hand over hand. No, I mean, don't use hand over hand. <laughs> Just talk to them on the board. Um, we don't get into anything else. We just show them how to, how to model and focus on that as the most useful strategy because that's what will get them the payoff of students learning to communicate. Here are some examples. This is just from my building. I walked around yesterday and took pictures. <laughs> we have, some of our teachers have posters up, which is great. Then they have some big core at the front of the rooms. Um, the, the 
core, the one page core board over here is one that we have taped down to a student's desk. Um, the student has an iPad with TouchJet that they use as their main system, but sometimes sometimes things go flying and it's just not safe to keep the iPad out. So we have a core board taped down to the desk so that words are always available even when we're dysregulated. Um, and we also have um, like some little mini lanyard size that people can ask for. So a lot of our staff wear those. Um, some students use them as a as like a light tech option at backup for them too. I see a question, do you use the exact same core board throughout the district? And the answer is yes, we do. Um, we have on our one page, some blank spots. So teachers or staff or anybody can add any extra words that they want. Um, we also use the flip book option. Um, there, TouchDat has some nice flip book options, which you can add as many flips as you want. Like you can add additional ones. Um, but it is really nice to have one board to rule them all, as I like to joke, um, because staff get used to it. They're like, oh, this is the core board. I know where the words are. They also know this is the core board in preschool and it's worth spending my time on it because when they go to developmental kindergarten, it's the same board. When they go into our intermediate classrooms, when they go into our high school classrooms, they all have access to the same board and it's not changing on them every every time they change schools. Um, so it's really helpful for staff buy-in to be able to, to, to show that consistency and that thoughtfulness in how we have set this up so that it's less work for everybody. Yeah, it looks like another school district went through the same process that we did. <laughs> I felt a little sad because I loved our district board. I still do love our district board. Um, it's a good board. Um, but the consistency of having the tier one and the tier two match was very useful for the buy-in factor. It wasn't an issue for the students. They can use, use whatever board they want. Um, but for staff buy-in, it was helpful to have it match. Oh, I see a question about how we came to an agreement at the district. Oh, touch tap versus lamp. Oh, I am not going to be able to help you with the with the any app versus lamp debate. Um, we lamp is an amazing app. Let me start with that. Um, it is a very good app. It is not as transparent from the outside. If you have, if you're not already using it, that is what I have found with training a lot of people on a lot of different apps. Um, LAMP is the one that is the hardest for me when I'm demonstrating it to new users or new families or new teachers who haven't used AAC before. It's the hardest one for them to grasp. And that is part of why our district didn't end up going with LAMP. We, we did not have very many LAMP users in our district. We do have some because for some students, it's a really great app. Um, but we ended up with touch chat more because um, in our area, the, the local children's hospital, um, they were favoring touch chat. Uh, and so we were getting a lot of students who were already had touch chat from our community. So if that with that as our background, touch chat made a lot more sense for us to kind of match what a lot of our, the way that our, a lot of our students were being supported out in the community. Um, and now it has shifted to where we are the ones who are most often starting the AAC journey. So now we're just kind of continuing it. I don't know. Linwood is going to be a touch chat hub. <laughs> Keep asking me those app questions because in the next tier, there's going to be more of them. More. Yeah, here we are. <laughs> tier two is a tablet with a communication app. Your question is anticipated the slide deck. The way that students get access to this is their SLP, their building SLP recommends it. It is very big that this is a building level intervention. Our building SLPs do not need permission from anybody to say, this kid is not speaking and they need an app. Or this kid can say some words with their mouth, but they can't really reliably express themselves. They need high tech AAC. They need voice output. So my role has been training them to know what to do, which has been so much easier when it's just one app. I don't have to teach them 20 apps. I can be like, here's the one. I want you comfortable with this one. If you see a kid and you think you could start with this one, go. Um, our, our, build, our district SOPs, I will go to the mat on this one. I think that Edmonds, that my district has the best SOP team in the state. You can fight me on that if you want. I love our team because they have done amazing at this. They have just taken it and ran with it. I am not looking at each kid who is being recommended and saying yes or no. 
are building SLPs or looking at each kid and saying yes or no, and then they tell me where to send the iPad. It's fabulous. They are mostly doing this independently. Oh, how many SLPs? We have 45, including me. No, we have 42 because we have some audiologists. Uh, we have 42 SLPs, including. So it's a it's a pretty big team. It's not as big as some other districts in our area, um, but it is a sizable team. And it has been a lift for all of our SLPs to kind of get on board with understanding, um, understanding and feeling comfortable with them being the, the experts, the specialists who are recommending um, an iPad with touch tech. I'm seeing lots of different sizes. Oh my goodness, 175, three. We've got all the ranges. Um, I, I love this. But yes, this is a building level thing. I am providing the SLPs the support to know what to do and they are the ones who are doing it. Mostly independently. 700 SLPs, God bless you. <laughs> Question, do you complete a full AAC evaluation before giving a device? The answer is no, we do not, because that is not research-based at this point. Um, if we have a student who's not speaking, who we're like, I think you probably need some AAC, we get the device and we go with it. We do not require a full AAC about it. Um, we will get to that, so don't worry. Uh, question about symbol sticks versus board maker. I have found that students will just use whatever is in front of them. We did use our district core board had board maker symbols. Now we're using the touch chat, which I think is symbol sticks. Nobody has been bothered by the shift. It's fine. Um, this is an important slide. Reasons for a student to be to receive those tier two supports. Um, if they are a long if they are likely to be a long term AAC user, meaning they're not speaking at school age, they need AAC support. We need to start. Um, if they need more vocabulary than a core board, that's a great reason for them to have AAC. Um, if they need voice output, they would need some high tech. Uh, if they're already using high tech AAC, of course they would need to continue uh, if they're interested in it. Uh, if the family or student has a, has a preference for high tech versus light tech, if they're really motivated by it. Uh, question about, do we typically go right into high tech? I would say, Sometimes, often, I would say often we do uh, because there is no prerequisite for high tech. You don't need to prove it with low tech before you go to high tech. But some students like the, like the light tech. Some students like the pictures. Some students like the flexibility, the, the weight of it. Um, it's really, some SLPs like to, to like show a core board and kind of establish some rapport before they throw a device into the mix. Um, we do not wait to do high tech. It's not a wait and see approach, um, but we don't hold back from starting with high tech if that appears to be indicated. Also, it's easier to customize as somebody in the chat just pointed out. So in terms of, oh, I see a question about funding. We will get there, don't worry. In terms of resources that the district is providing, the district, in our district, the district is providing a tablet with the tier two app. We use the volume purchase program to purchase the apps um, in bulk. If you haven't heard about the volume purchase program, sign up. It means that when you buy at least 20 licenses of anything, you get it half off. Uh, if you time that with the AAC app sales in like October and April-ish, you can get half off of half off. So we are usually paying about paying $75 per app for a $300 app because you can get it half off, half off. Um, question about a student whose speech is highly unintelligible can get a tier two tablet? Yes. Based on the SLP and the building's recommendation, if they think that a student needs high tech because they can't be understood, yes. Basically, I am not the gatekeeper for whether a kid needs it. It's the SLP in the building and I am trusting them because I have provided them with lots of research-based professional development and they are running with it. And we are, it has been fantastic seeing how much growth we are seeing um, and how much decrease in behavior we are seeing, which will come up again later. So yeah, my role in this tier two is not touching every student and making sure everybody's doing it, their job. My job is providing training for our SLPs so that they know what to do. Um, 
and getting the resources together. We are justifying the providing an iPad with an app um, as an accessible version of a Chromebook. All of our typically developing students who are non-disabled in our district have a district provided device. In our district, it's a Chromebook. Um, but for our kids who are non-speaking, that device doesn't meet their needs. They need a different device. An iPad is a common device. It's not like we're providing them the moon. We're providing them very basic tech that is broadly available in our society. Uh, so we are just providing it. We are buying, we are putting the iPads in the cases that Apple guarantees they won't break in. So if they do break, we send them back to Apple and they replace them for us. Um, it is a financial commitment for that aspect of it. And if your district won't bite off on that, you could, um, I'm gonna put a little plug here, you could work through a company such as AbleNet with the Quick, uh, Quick Talk or Freestyle funding program or some of the other, like, other community options for getting that tier two tool, tier two tool, that's a, that's a time twister. Um, but just know that it is not unreasonable for a district to provide an accessible device to a student who's not speaking. Um, oh, I see a district just purchased iPads for each student in the district. Um, the question is, would I recommend installing an AAC app on their classroom device? Um, I would say it is best if a student can talk and do their work at the same time. But if you can't get that, go with what you have. Like it is better than nothing for a student to have an AAC app on their tablet. Um, so I would say reality is real and do what you can. Best practices to be able to have an app for talking and then an app for doing your work. But adult AAC users often use the same device. It's a lot of that is personal preference for the, for the AAC user, so. So another question, the iPads go home with the student? They can, they don't always, um, but once a student is using it as a communication device, they do need to still talk at home. Um, when we get to that point where the student is reliably using it, that is when we start to work with families often through like a quick talk or freestyle program or through their insurance to get them their own device that they own. The basically the school device is functioning like a trial device um, because it is weird for the school district to own their adaptive equipment. That's not something that is a long-term feels good thing to be happening, right? It's just like we wouldn't want to be owning students' wheelchairs. And then when they leave the district, we keep, because when they leave the district, we keep the device. It's, we own it. Um, but if they need it and we can show that they need it, it is a very easy process to show insurance. Yes, they need it. They're already using it. They just need to have one that they own. Um, looks like there's a lot of different ways that that is going in some different districts. I'm going to keep going because I want to make sure that we don't run out of time. Here are some examples. Um, I always love to have examples just because the students are why we need to do this. The students are why all of us are in public ed. So this is a student. In this picture, she's using a stander that one of our amazing PTs got set up for her. Um, she is a wheelchair user. She is self-ambulatory, so she moves herself around in her wheelchair, um, and she's practicing moving herself around while she's standing but she has um, her own iPad um, that there's like a stand up there and she has touch chat on it. And she is one of the reasons that we are using touch chat because she is new to our school this year. And she came with a home device that already had touch chat on it because she was supported at our local children's hospital. Uh, so it was really nice that the system that she came with matches the system that everybody is already very familiar with. Um, this video, I will play a little bit of it. You see another student. Um, she, this is a first grader. She has a step-by-step -step that she is using to participate in some shared reading. And she also has her iPad. And then this is um, one of our SLPs who has their their SLP iPad, both from the both from the district, and they both have touch chat open. Should we push it again? Hey. Don't push the button. You want to read it? Don't push the button. Azalea, I'm going to push it. Push. Let's see what happens. Now I'm yellow and polka dots. Oh no. He's yellow and has pink polka dots. Look at that. Oh my goodness. He's yellow and pink. Oh no. What's so that was a nice example. So she, this was a year and a half ago. She is still at my school. 
um, and this was right after we had started um, with an iPad with her. She is now navigating herself through three different levels of folders to find the words that she wants. Um, talking with it up like talking a storm, she'll match whatever the adults are seeing around her and just has a ton of really cool language going on. Um, and this is why having access to high tech, robust high tech is so important is that it's the tool that we use to teach the language. Um, it is not that the kids need to learn the language and then they get the tool. It's that we give them the tool so that they can learn the language. Um, and it was just a really nice example of the staff the, her modeling that was going into the way she's using it now, which is very cool. Uh, I see. Oh, questions about challenging behaviors. Let's circle back to that one. Uh, the next question, how do you support staff when a child brings a device that uses an app different than touch chat? We will get into that in just a bit. That'll be tier three is where that is covered. So a question that lots of people ask me when they see our tiers, they see tier one, which is a core board that's 60. It's, the, it's based on, on Word Power 60. Tier two, where we start at Word Power 60, um, and I actually got a question this today about this, so this is very relevant for me personally. What about beginning AAC? I'm gonna let I'm gonna pause to let people read this quote from Jane Farrell. It's just such a good quote. The point being, there is no beginning AAC in terms of a system. A beginning AAC system is the same system as an advanced AAC system. And the difference is what the people around the student do with it. So we have made our tiers so that if somebody wants to provide beginning AAC, AKA not so great AAC, very limited AAC. <laughs> they have to make it themselves. I'm not gonna make it for them. I'm not gonna provide it for them. Um, I had a teacher ask me today if I could give them a simplified core board with just like 10 words so they could work on those and then start some more. Um, and I was able to say, I'm sorry, I don't have that. And I can't make, I don't have time to make it for you. Also, did you know that the research says the like starting at 60 buttons at least is where we should be starting. Um, and let me set up a time to like get together and train you like so that you can know what to do with all those words. Like it opens up a chance for conversation. Um, I never just say no. I say, oh, oh, I actually can't, but let me tell you tell you why this is a great tool um, and help the teacher to become comfortable with it. It's an, it's an opportunity for some sharing of information, um, but it makes it hard for people to do bad AAC because all of the tools that are easy and available to them are good ones and all of them are robust or in the case of a core board, not crazy unrobust. Like a core board is not robust because it doesn't have voice output, um, but it has a lot of words on there. We don't have any options that have only 10 words and that is by design. We want to make it so that good AMC is the easy path for all of our staff. Even if they don't really understand why or don't really like they're not fully on board with the concept of you start robust. Um, if the easy option for them to get a hold of is robust, that is the path of least resistance for them. Um, and it is very helpful to have a set, a set of tools that are all good. So people, if people are like, oh, I can't try a high tech AAC yet. That's too much. That's too complicated. I can be like, oh, okay, I'll give you a core board that has 50 flip pages. There's 300 words here. Let's start there. <laughs> oh, I think we just had a realization in the chat. Um, yes, young children can just visually scan that much. If you think about it, um, toddlers, I have two toddler nieces. They can navigate YouTube. They can find their favorite songs. They can play the section of their favorite song that they want to find on that teeny tiny little, little like, um, navigation bar at the bottom of that screen. All of the ads are on there. Like any kid who can navigate a smartphone can easily navigate a grid of 60. Um, 
of course, the, the, the exception for that is if there's CVI or motor, like if, if the student cannot see or touch the screen, that might be a reason to do some alternate access. Um, but you should be starting with the largest grid size that a student can see and touch. That is, that is current best practice. Um, you do not need to start with PECs. You, and in fact, you should not start with PECs. You should start robust, start with all the words, um, because then you don't have to worry about adding them later. Uh, I'm seeing more questions about tier three. So I'm going to keep going because I think we're, I think this is where people are wondering. Tier three is where we are in the specialized system area. This is where we're doing um, an assistive tech consult where the assistive tech team, which is myself and an OT, um, we get together with the IEP team, we could do a consult with them, we'll come out and do an observation of the student, figure out exactly what that student needs. So the SET framework is stands for Student Environment Tasks and Tools. Um, and so we're looking at all of those things. Um, our, uh, if, if you go into the slide deck, you can get more information about kind of that process. Um, and this is where you have what looks like an like a formal AAC evaluation, where we are looking at specific things that the student needs, um, like if they have vision needs, if they have motor needs. Um, it looks, it and it is for any student who's not supported by tiers one and two. If you know that a student has specific needs, they go straight here. You don't have to remember, it's not a sequence where you have to try and fail. Um, it is not tied to special ed paperwork. It's just as needed, we go in and we support teams in figuring out what other system a student might need if tier one or two isn't supporting them. Reasons for a student to need this are if they need alternate access, if they need to use eye gaze or switches or partner scanning, um, if they have complicated motor or vision or medical needs, if they need a dedicated device that has specific features, if they're already using a robust system that has an established motor plan. So the question before about what do we do if a kid comes in with a different system that they're already using, uh, we just we support that system. We do not ask a student to change because our system is different. Um, they would be considered a, a student who's using tier three tools and we support them with those tools. Uh, we do not support tools that don't meet our minimum AAC requirements. Um, but if a family has a strong preference for a different system, we have a couple of families who have said we really want to use LAMP and they are. We, we don't tell them no. We go through the, we go through all the considerations and figure out and oh, sometimes LAMP is what it is. Yes, we do not hold a review of existing data meeting and the, we are including a whole IEP team, but it is not part of special ed paperwork. This is all of the background work that goes into on that IEP um, team considerations where you're looking at what assistive tech needs are there. This is all of the background work that happens in between IEPs. So when you do the IEP, you write in all the stuff you've been doing all year. Uh, I'm going to just click on this one link because it takes us to our district AAC framework, just kind of undergirding all of this work. Um, we have a lot of research and resources that are kind of linked into this, um, some guiding principles. But the second page has intervention strategies that we're focusing on as a district. And we have minimum requirements because we do not provide AAC systems that violate students' um, right to communicate how they want, what they want, to whom they want, when they want. Um, any robust system will meet all of these requirements. Um, any of the robust AAC apps will meet them. It has to have the alphabet. It has to incorporate principles of motor planning. They have to be able to combine words. It has to have a lot of words of all different kinds. Um, any of the re like robust systems will meet this. PEX does not meet this, and that's why we don't do PEX. Uh, question about parent consent for set. We do not need parent consent because it's not like an IEP meeting. We invite parents often, and sometimes they're able to come. Uh, parents are often part of that. But it's just like any meeting where a school team is meeting to figure out what do we need to provide to make sure the student has what they need. Those kind of meetings happen all the time. Problem solving meetings, um, guidance team meetings, like all of those happen a lot. So this is just that same kind of meeting. Um, if your district is concerned about it, invite the parents to come. 
they they often do. We're typically meeting on Zoom. Um, and parents often come. So I have a few examples. In tier three, everything everything is on the table. So there's a lot of different options that are that are used. Um, this is a, one of my friends, JT, who has a head switch and an elbow switch. And for the majority of the day, those are hooked up to voice output buttons that are either like yes and no or high and by. And we're using a lot of partner assisted scanning on robust apps. Um, but we've been working with his family and he has a high tech device that he is using with eye gaze and he's learning to use it with switch scanning. So he's like mid process figuring out what's going to work for him. Um, he also has a lot of community, like he has community therapy and a lot of community support as well. Um, this is another board that I made for a student who is primarily spelling. Um, and it was to put on his wheelchair tray so that he could always have the alphabet available for him. Cause that this, the, this particular student wants to speak orally that's his primarily that's the primary way he wants to communicate but it's just very hard to understand him and he doesn't like tech he doesn't like screens so we had to come up with a low tech way um, to help him to be, communicate more successfully so we're working on like a first letter strategy with him this is oh this is another student i will play this video it's not very long um she has a yes and a no switch that she uses either her cheek or her nose to activate and they are, she also just got a, high, a full robust high tech device that has a pod set loaded on it that she is learning how to access with switch scanning. You will see her not care about what's happening. They're doing some shared writing. Um, and until the paraeducator offers her the chance to use the alphabet to pick what she wants to say on her shared writing. And then all of a sudden she's like all up and go and saying all sorts of things. So I'll just play that for you. Do you want a break? Mm -hmm. Do you want to break? Mm -hmm. Come back on the table. Let's see if you want to try again. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. We can also be done. Do you want to look at the paper up close? We've done one, two sentences. Right? Do you want to say a shark eats squid mm. or a shark eats fish? Yummy! A yummy, shark yummy, eats yummy, fish? Yummy. You're leaning more towards your no. So we'll put this in the try again. Do you want to say the fish eats squid? Or the shark eats squid? Offer Let's something come back else. To this one. Like something, something different? Yeah. Do you want something different? Do you want to say the shark eats something that starts with one of these letters? A, B, C, or D? No, it doesn't look like it. Does it start with one of these letters? E, F, G, or H? Yes. E? Yep. Okay. What about, yep. do you want to say the shark eats elephant seal? You're leaning on your yes. Elephant seal? Yep. All right, we're gonna write that one. I love that video because she looked like she wasn't even paying attention. And then as soon as she got access to the alphabet, she was right on it. It was like, no, yes, yes. Um, it's just so, it shows the importance of the alphabet um, and also how communication can look different for all sorts of different things. Um, so tier three is a, it's a small number of students, um, and it can be literally anything. And the thing that I love about having tiers and having a tier two and a different tier three is that what used to happen is for in Sharina's classroom, for example, we had like all of the students in there are non-speaking and use some form of AAC. And when they all had different systems, maybe two of them were using the same, two others were using something different. We had Proloquo, we may have had LAMP at some point, we had some touch chat, uh, we had we had we all, all sorts of stuff. Uh, the, the task of teaching the classroom staff what to do was almost insurmountable. It was so hard to teach them five different systems. And it was literally five different systems. Um, now, it is still the same classroom. They have the same number of non-speaking students, but the majority of them are using touch chat with word power. And Sharina 
and one other student are using a different system. And I have found that now that the rest of the students are using something that the staff feel comfortable with, they actually have, they have time for me when I come in and say, hey, can I just show you how to use Sharina's system? Uh, they have the bandwidth to learn something new because AAC for most of the students has gotten much, much more familiar. I won't say easier, it's never easy, but it's got much more familiar. It feels simpler to them because it's a system that they know. And now Sharina's like, all of the other students are doing something I know. Sharina's is different. I can take time to learn Sharina's. When it's, I need to take time to learn Sharina's and David's and Sam's and Sally's and like that, that becomes impossible. But when it's one or two that are the different ones, it is much more approachable and staff are much more able. Like they just literally have more capacity to learn the new thing because the, uh, the rest of it has gotten a lot easier. And that is the biggest takeaway from tier three is that when you make the rest of it easier, you have more time to spend on those students who really need a specific system with all of the specific features exactly right. Um, particularly alternate access. Alternate access is automatically tier three. It's tricky. Yeah, yeah. There we go. So that is that is tier three. Just checking the chat. There you go. Um, selective mutism is beyond the scope of this hour. We have seven minutes left, so I'm going to pause. I'm going to pass on that one. But it's a very good question. Um, for funding, one thing about having tiers is that the funding for tiers one and two, once you've done it for a year or two, you will get a sense of how many core boards you send out and how many iPads you're gonna need and how many apps you're gonna need. And you can build those into your budget. You can buy things in bulk to make them cheaper and you can just build it in and say, hey, building administrator, district administrator, here's the rationale for why we need this. Here are some, here is some success stories about it. You can, you can really show, you can show them some charts. Administrators love charts. And they understand MTSS. This is speaking their language and they can understand, oh, it's a tier two. We need to have it available. It needs to be, we needs to be funded. We're going to need approximately this many. Um, you can predict that budgeting, which makes it much more approachable on their side. And you can show them charts, which, which they just love. Um, tier three, you can't really predict how much it's going to cost because you don't know which students are going to get in any given year. However, you will probably find that a lot of your, like basically what most districts are doing now is maybe a tier one, nothing in the middle, and then every kid is tier three if they're non-speaking, which means that you have a ton of kids in that I need to touch everyone and make sure and figure it out individually for each student. If you have a robust tier two, a lot of kids will end up there and you will have a much smaller number in the actual tier three needs which you will have more time for, and it will probably, it will just be a smaller number of students. So it will be more approachable from that sense. So that is how we're kind of addressing the funding. Um, for two students who need tier three supports, they probably qualify for safety net funding. Um, in Washington state, that is something that we do to kind of help supplement our, our district budget for those specific needs. Um, so that may be one place where you can get the funding or working with their insurance um, and other funding sources to get them what they need. Just as a side note, I won't belabor this, but you can apply this framework to any tools in assistive technology. This is our admins, uh, broader assistive tech tiers, like Google Read and Write is something that's available for everybody. Um, if students have vision needs, they might need a larger Chromebook, um, power mobility. Um, there's a, you can just organize a lot of assistive tech tools in this framework and it can fit really nicely and help, help to organize the resources and help to organize the funding as well. So I talked a lot. Um, results that we are getting in our district, most of our non-speaking students um, are getting robust AAC in preschool, often within a few weeks of starting with us, which is phenomenal. Like that has not happened before. I used to get third graders who had been in our district since preschool who still didn't have robust AAC or really anything set up. And now everybody knows, oh, if there's a non-speaking kid, they probably need an app with an iPad. I know which one to start with, let's go. Um, so our staff are doing a phenomenal job of getting AAC early to the majority of students. Um, we are seeing, as this has been rolled out for like about six years, like I said, um, 
some we have some some of those I call them high impact classrooms. You know the kind of classroom where the kids have big behaviors and big bodies, and every kid has a one on one. We have one of those. It's got like twelve students, twelve paras, and a teacher. Um, but the pipeline of like the classrooms that have been feeding into that classroom are drying up. We don't have students in the younger grades who are going to need that. And I predict in two or three years, we might actually close that classroom because it won't have students because students are gonna be going to their their neighborhood schools, sometimes in you know intensive support classrooms or things, but they're not needing the massively high level of resources as they get big um, because we're meeting their needs when they're younger. Um, and that is, from a human rights perspective, just a big thing. Um, our building level teams are implementing AAC and AT early and independently, which means that I have the time to, ind to individually go and support those students who have the super different bodies and different needs and who need very specialized systems. And um, we have about 30 students in our district who are receiving kind of tier three level AAC supports. Um, and, and I can go out and visit them all and see what they need and problem solve with their teams and try different things um, and really get into getting them a really customized system that works for them because I'm not spending all my time passing out iPads. Our building SLPs are doing that, which is fantastic. If you are thinking that this is an approach that you kind of want to dip your toe in, I would say, please do. It's been amazing in our district. Um, start by making a list. Figure out what AAC tools are already in your district, light tech, high tech, everything in between. Um, and you're going to need to work on consensus building. Um, like the question earlier, touch tap versus lamp. I can't answer that for you. You are going to need to answer that for you. And it's going to depend a lot on the expertise that you already have in your district the community resources that are around your district. Do you have community providers who have drank the Kool-Aid and are lamp, lamp for life? Um, or do you have, you know, do you have nothing going on? Do you have some, so like, it'll really depend on your context. Also your budget, TD Snap is super affordable and robust. It's not my favorite app, but if you have $50, it might be your favorite app. Um, there's a lot of factors to consider in figuring out which tools are the right ones for your context um, and that will take consensus building both of, like on a linear like this level and an up and down level um, you're going to need to get building and district administrators buying in as well as like colleagues buying in um, to build that consensus around which tools would fit your needs for those tiers one and two and then like i said tier three anything goes and this process takes time it took our district I would say about three years to get a good start and then another two years to like finesse and kind of figure things out till they were really fully implemented and working. Um, it was absolutely worth the time and energy because it is now less work to su more, support many more AAC users than we used to have. Um, but it does take time. It's, it won't happen overnight and it won't happen without intentional work to make it happen. So give yourself grace and space and time for that. And it is exactly 5 p.m. and I am finished with the slides. Um, I am able to stay on and answer questions for maybe another five, 10 minutes. Um, if you would like to grab the handouts, the QR code is there. There are right. a few questions in the Q&A. Yes. Are you able to see that? I don't see that actually. Okay. Um, How about you tell me? And I will. I <laughs> uh, if you have a student with significant motor deficits who you know would not be able to access these tier one and two options, would you immediately bypass these and move to tier three? Yes. All right. That's an easy question. Yes. If you already <laughs> know that tier two isn't going to work for them, just go straight into figuring out what will work for them. All right. Do you provide mid-tech devices as, as well? And then there's a follow-up at the tier one level. So tier one is any student, whether or not they're receiving special ed services. Um, so probably not at tier one. At tier one, it's all of the paper-based resources. If they're if they have an IEP, um, we might provide some mid-tech stuff. Like you saw in the in the videos of the tier three, um, you saw some step by steps and some switches and stuff like that. Um, we do provide some mid-tech stuff 
as it, but I want to caveat that with a gigantic asterisk. That is not their AAC system. That is part of their AAC system because those mid tech devices are not robust on their own. But they can be excellent supports or add ons to a robust system or things that you can use while you're figuring out what a system is going to work. Um, so we do use them quite a bit. I just don't want anybody to think that that's sufficient for AAC. Does that answer the question? Uh, the next question, uh, who trains the teachers slash paras with and with, and with what frequency? Well, up to this point, so I would say for the past four or five years, I have been doing a lot of Zooming with teachers and classroom teams. Um, I use the Project Core um, Aided Language Input Module a lot. Um, that is linked on the handout page. Um, the Project Core modules are excellent. Um, and the Aided Language Input one is a great one. Um, I've taken that and kind of added some other stuff into it that I use for like my training. Um, but you could just use the Project Core module as is. It's, it's great. So I have been doing a lot of that with a classroom team. Uh, what I found is it only takes kind of one time for me going into the classroom team and kind of getting people started and understanding what they're supposed to do. And once they understand, oh, I don't need to make the kid talk. I just need to show them talking. Um, they can usually take it from there. But I've done that long enough that now our SPs are comfortable. And this is year, this year the shift has happened where most of the time they email me and they're like, hey, Melissa, can, can you send me your slide deck? I want to train my parents, which is so great because it means I have more time. <laughs> um, but that did take a little while to build that capacity. Um, and I think it was mostly building the capacity of our SLPs to really feel like they know what to do and have enough authority to tell Paris, this is what you should do. And even now, sometimes I still go out because sometimes it's just nice to have it not be you. Like have, have the have the fancy expert in the blazer come in from outside and tell you what to do. And then everybody, like, you know, kind of sits up straight and listens closer. Um, sometimes that's that sometimes that's my role. Just put on a blazer and be the outside expert versus like the, the, the team could do it themselves. But much more it is our building SLPs who are providing that training. Um, some of our IEPs have it written in that staff get AAC training every year, uh, which is a sneaky way to make it happen. Um, a parent did it one time and I was like, oh, good idea. So I've been writing that into my IEPs just to kind of force it to be like, oh, it says annually. We have to do it annually. Um, annually is a good, is a pretty good frequency um, just because there's so much turnover in staffing at any of those classrooms that re renewing it annually, you're going to have some new people who didn't hear it before. So I would say annually is a good frequency. All right. Um, uh comment question i do almost exclusively alternate access and would love to hear some of your favorite resources for these students i would say my my go-to my mvp is a step-by-step -step. um with set up with whatever switch access point they can use usually head sometimes hand but usually head i've got a couple of kids who use their feet um, or an elbow um you saw the picture of J jt with an elbow um I love the voice output switches because you could do the cycle of, I often have them, one of them is a yes and one of them is a no, but I do a cycle, not, not just not like, yes, yes, yes. But they're like, yes, totally, absolutely. Coach my goats, you got it. And get like a cycle that sounds more like a conversation. Because what I have found is that that is not robust, but they can use that for partner assisted scanning. And once they have yeses and nos that sound like a conversation, the people around them all of a sudden notice that that kid is competent and they are understanding what's happening and they should ask them their opinion instead of just assuming it, which is the start of, yes, we need to get the whole team on board with getting this kid robust to AAC. Um, and it can be very useful to have that part, ha have those to aid in partner assisted scanning um, while you're figuring out what system they can use. Um, yeah, I use those all the time it's my it's probably the first thing that i set up when i get a new student who has complex needs and i don't know what their access is going to end up being if i can just get two switch sites and a yes and a no i know they can use their head like they can use you know their body to show me yes and no too but something about having it verbal having an auditory for the other people 
really helps the rest of their community to see see their competence um, in a way that's very powerful. So that's 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 what I would say. That's my favorite. That was not actually an AbleNet ad. It's just the thing that I use. I know you guys sell those, and I love them. All right, there are two more questions. Okay. Tiers fit into the IEP process, i.e. are tier one students on an IEP? At, at what level are treatment minutes being met and implemented versus the teacher pair implementing? Oh, okay. So the the assistive tech tools are separate from the IEP process. Um, anybody can ask for a core board for any reason. Um whether or not they have a disability. So tier tier one tools can be used by any student, um, whether or not they have an IEP. A lot of our students with IEPs use core boards, uh, which is great. Um, but the question of do they need a core board is separate from the question of do they have a disability? And the question of are they speaking or not speaking or somewhere in between is separate from which tools fit best for them. Um, so, and in terms of minutes and stuff, all of that is kind of on the IEP side. Building SLPs are providing language therapy, probably involving AUC tools to access that language for kids who need AUC. Um, but they are providing that through their language therapy or their speech therapy or whatever goals are on their IEP. And the assistive tech tools are just the tools we use to access the instruction. All right. And the final question, do you hide some vocabulary if the child seems overwhelmed or cannot visually attend? That is a great question. Um, and my aunt, well, I do not, as a general rule, hide vocabulary. And the reason why is because I have not yet seen any evidence that that is an evidence-based practice. I have never seen any research supporting it. I have never seen any research comparing masking buttons to not comparing not masking buttons on a robust system and seeing what different outcomes you get. Um, it is something that the grown-ups decided to do, as far as I can tell, grown-ups decided to do because we felt overwhelmed and projected that onto students. Um, since I have stopped projecting that, I have no I have not seen students be overwhelmed generally. The exception is if a student has like actual CVI and vision, like in that case, a visual display can be overwhelming. Um, but unless there's like an actual diagnosed vision condition, it is probably not the student who is feeling overwhelmed, it is probably you. Um, the times that I see students feel overwhelmed is when the adults are trying to force them to say something when they haven't shown them what those words are and they haven't been modeling them. If they're doing hand over hand, or try, just basically trying to coerce children into talking instead of showing them how fun it is to talk. Um, that's when I see kids get overwhelmed and shut down and start talking iPads. Um, so that's a kind of a long answer to that question. But no, I don't hide vocabulary um, as a general rule. Um, if a, sometimes a student is choosing not to look at me because they're worried that I'm going to ask them to do something hard, that I see a lot. I see a lot of intentional ignoring of me because they're because I haven't spent time building the trust and showing them that I'm not going to ask them to do something that's too hard. Um, so I address that by providing a lot of sensory tools up front. Like I start my sessions with, what sensory tool do you want to use today? And I like, do you want to hold a koosh? Do you want to hold a fidget? Do you want to hold a spinner? Um, and doing a lot of shared reading where the goal is just let's interact about a book. You can say a word, you could point, you could do anything. You could just sit here and watch. That's cool. Like decrease my demands on them and show them how fun it is to use the words. Um, and that is how I get over that hump rather than hiding words and trying to, I don't know. I A kid can't learn a word if it's not there. And when we hide the words, we take away the ability for them to use, to learn that word incidentally. Um, which is something that I think we should not do unless there's a very specific reason like CBI. I always give long answers, sorry. Thank you so much for everyone for um, spending time here tonight. Um, I have had fun. I hope you have. All right. Thank you very much, Melissa, uh, for sharing your knowledge and exp expertise with us. Uh, for those of you who are still here, um, 
please be sure to complete that assessment. I'll put that link in the chat again. And again, and as I mentioned earlier, you'll receive that in a follow-up email tomorrow as well. You're always welcome to email ableu at ablenetinc.com and request that link or anything else if you have any questions. Uh, the, the assessment must be completed at 80% and it will be open for one week. Thank you everyone for attending and have a great night.